Why did the PowerPoint presentation cross the road? Well, he didn't slide across the road. Uh -huh. Not bad, Ben. Yeah, to get to the other slide. Ah. <laughs> uh, that's better. That's better. <laughs> And with that, Alex Nemi, welcome to the Dark Moon Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Ben and Gabe. Good to be here. Very excited to have you. Highly anticipated episode. I think we reached out to you two years ago. So the day has finally come. Has it been that long? Well, we are. <laughs> no, not It's been a busy two years. It's been an but yeah, exactly. You've been jet setting all around Asia, Pacific, and Japan. So we understand. Very excited to get into all things your perspective, your cybersecurity, big mega trends, all the cool things we love to talk about on dark mode. But I thought maybe for those unsuspecting members of the audience, I would take the liberty to introduce a little bit about your background, Alex. Alex Nemi is a chief security officer at Palo Alto Networks and former science of SA Power Networks, the AE Systems and the University of Adelaide. Short and charming. Yeah. Alex, Definitely. welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So just on that, you are you actually have been jet setting around sort of the JPAC theater, Alex. What are what does your day to day look like at the moment? Yeah, my my day to day looks like uh, air, airports, planes, and and hotels basically, and 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 customer offices. Um, Ben's laughing. I think he can can relate. But uh, it's you know it, it, it's fantastic when you're a size of who, like I've spent the past sort of decade and a bit doing. You're somewhat insular, like you're really focused on your organization and on your security posture. And when you're a vendor chief security officer, you're out talking to CISOs. So what I love about this role is I'm out talking to all these different CISOs and different organizations, mainly in the critical infrastructure and, and industrial space from, you know, medical and hospitals through to manufacturing and, uh, and, you know, energy networks and critical infrastructure. But I get to hear their challenges, their fears, their, their risks, their incidents. And it's just a really fascinating insight in, into what's going on in, in Asia Pacific. Yeah. So it's, it's been a great experience. Alex, how, how does that change from when you were the CISO at the organizational level, transition out to vendor level? What's the feeling like going from the organizational to the vendor? It, it's really different, right? This, this is my first vendor gig and it's been about two and a half years. And my my first feeling was such a relief that I'm no longer I no longer have my head on the chopping block operationally every day. Like my phone used to ring around the clock, and and as soon as it rings, you're just like, "Have we been hacked? What 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 what's gone wrong? What's broken? Who's upset with me now?" And so you, in the vendor world, I don't have any operational responsibilities. I get to go and evangelize and and talk to customers and you know, advise them and, and, and that that's fantastic. Probably the other biggest change was not having a team. I, I ran teams for well over a decade and, you know, I love running a team and I love growing and building teams and, and building high performance teams, but I love not running teams for a while as well. Like it's just be, being a, a lone agent is, is really refreshing as well. Um, I, I, I just, I love that freedom. It's almost a bit like a holiday from the size of precious. Diff different. You've got, the, you've got the experience there too, to have an empathetic approach, to understand what the organizational CISO is going through. So I think that's an important, uh, lineage to draw when you're evangelizing, you've got the mindset of what the current CISO you're sitting in front of all that C-suite, uh, being affected by and potentially what their stresses are. Yeah, I, I love that because just naturally I talk their language because I still my, still see myself as a size um, and, and, and I always will be, you know, security operations and, and being a size though is what I do. Um, I just happen to have a different spin on, on this side of the fence. So when I talk to customers, you know, I, I tend to gravitate towards talking about risk and, and talking about how you know, what risks are they managing? How are they managing them? And it, it, it's quite a different conversation than what like a traditional salesperson would have when they're really trying to position a product, you know, front and, and, and foremost. And, and CISOs and security staff really respond to that. They, they respond to someone 
speaking their language and, and having empathy because they've done the job. You know, I, I know the stresses that they're going through. What are some of the big risks at the moment, Alex, that you're having conversations about? This seems to be either hugely topical sometimes in one area and then other times it seems pretty fluid in terms of risk management and mitigation. But is there anything sort of top of mind for the SISO community across the region at the moment? Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the risk of the day and, and the risk of the, the decade, I think, is is ransomware, right? So something that I worried about and, and I know a lot of SISOs worry about is when are we going to get compromised? When are we going to have that major ransomware incident? Because I, I really think having a major incident and, and touch wood, I, I never had one as a SISO, but, you know, it, it really is a matter of time. Yes, you can lower the likelihood of that happening. But a, a, a major incidents do happen. They happen to really big companies. They happen to companies even that have mature security postures, right? So ransomware is something that I, I really just think is always in the back of a SISO's mind. But then I tend to talk to SISO's a lot about securing industrial environments, you know, hospitals, manufacturing, energy grids, things like that. And it's... It, it, it shouldn't surprise me, but it does continually surprise me how, I don't know if immature is, is, is too hard a word, but, but how kind of backwards operational technology and industrial cybersecurity is from where our IT is. And, and, you know, we have a look at the major incidents that are happening in the IT world, right? The, the data losses, the, the major ransomware incidents. And yes, organizations should have a higher security posture than what they have. But in OT, we're, we're 10 years behind. Um, and it, it, it still surprises me. And I, I'm lucky enough to get to travel around Asia Pacific and talk to SISOs from some of the largest industrial organizations, global brand name customers. And I walk in and, and you know, the first thing I ask them is, do you have visibility of all your industrial assets? Do you actually know what is out there? Do you know what you're securing? Uh, and I'd say nine and a half times out of 10, they kind of just give me this blank look and say, no, we, we don't know. And in fact, I did a, an IOT, OT roadshow around Australia and Asia Pac this time last year. And I did a show of hands at every event. And I don't think a single customer put their hand up and said, we, we know all of our, all of our devices. So if you don't know your devices, how can you even begin to secure them? Like we, we're not even at step one. It's such a fascinating concept. I moved into to OT for that reason too. I think it's, uh, excuse me, it's, it's, it's so, it, it puts critical in the term critical infrastructure, right? We depend on, on absolutely everything from industrial networks and industrial systems, the tables we're working on, the laptops that we're using right now, the electricity that powers the laptops, um, all the way to the intricate micro systems that are built into the laptop, let alone the water that we use to wash our teeth this morning. I hope everyone brushed yeah. their teeth. Shout out to Sean uh, Duca for that comment. Um, but uh, it's, it's, really, it's really such an interesting topic that not many people understand um, in terms of the, the aspect or the, the criticality in OT systems. Uh, Rob Lee, our CEO, talks about OT as the, the point where it's, it's the point where physics meet computing systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and it makes mm -hmm. so much sense. It's, it's the lifeblood of uh, mm -hmm. the way we live, the way we operate, and the way we rely on for quick comfort systems as well. Um, but over the years, we've put so much emphasis on IT systems uh, to secure uh, and somewhat gone under the radar is the OT networks themselves, which we're seeing become front page news at the moment. Uh, as we record this in the last few days, we've had the DP World incident uh, that has potentially impacted uh, third party supply for the Christmas period and beyond. Uh, the actual effects of that we, we won't see for some time. Um, we've got the, the ASDs this morning, as we were recording today, ASD released their, uh, their annual review or their cyber threat yeah, report. Certainly. And uh, the first comments in there in the executive summary are state actors focused on critical infrastructure the first two top comments that before hasn't been seen. So we're starting to talk about OT and IOT as the, the criti critical systems that they should be referenced as. It's, it's such an interesting space to be in. It, it, it really is, Ben. And, you know, OT for any industrial organization, like a port, an electricity grid, a manufacturing organization, a hospital, 
the, those industrial systems, that's the heart of the business. That, that is their business. It's their operations. It's the um, systems that generate their revenue for the organization. I'm constantly amazed that I sit down and talk to CISOs and they're like, yeah, we, we really focused on IT security and we, we're doing all right in that department. We, we haven't really done anything in OT. You know, they, they won't let us in. They won't let us help. We don't know where to start. Um, and they're, they're kind of just beginning to broach that topic of OT security. And yet they've secured all, secured all of those peripheral systems, but they haven't secured the heart of the organization. I'm just amazed that we almost did it in reverse, you know, and uh, what other point was I, I going to make? Yeah. So the, the resistance to OT security really is cultural. Like there's no technical reason why we can't have a secure OT environment. Really, it is generally the operational technology engineers that are saying we don't want to disrupt availability. We, we don't want to disrupt any systems. Um, let, let's not do any cybersecurity. It's always been fine as it is. Let's just keep going how we've been. But these OT environments are now way more connected than they've ever been. They're more at risk than, than they've ever been. And uh, we haven't put the security in to match that risk. Yeah. I noticed I've got a halo. To carry on that, that thought there is, uh, is I understand why there's hesitancy, um, having transitioned from IT into OT over the last year, you know, you hear the stories of, of the OT networks themselves and especially in North America and beyond some of these manufacturing and electricity grids and distribution centers and, and the industrial networks more broadly have had generational uh, experience throughout them. They were built by someone's granddad. They were built by someone's great granddad and carried throughout the years, the certain protocols in there that don't exist outside of that specific network because they were created for a certain function uh, within that network. So in order to then come in and put computing policy on top of that uh, to support the security uplift, there is going to be a natural uh, uh, objection to that. Uh, and by right there, there is because there's potential impact to the productivity or the, uh, the availability of those networks. But when it comes to the critical side of it, this is what we need to be focused on moving forward to, to protect the way of life. Um, Rob also talked about, you know, starting Dragos. It was, it was more of a, uh, a, a selfish start because he wanted to make sure that his sons had access or safe access to water and lights when they grew up. And that that's, that. brings home the criticality of some of these networks. I love how real Rob makes the whole OT security challenge and, and issue. I, I just love listening to him. Um, I'm currently preparing to present at a conference in, in New Zealand in a couple of weeks on healthcare security, digital healthcare. And, you know, I've been bringing my presentation together and doing some research. And, uh, I, I was looking at this device that is literally like it has a, has a medical name, but I'm, I'm not a doctor. I'm, I'm going to call it the heart and lungs machine, right? So if you're say you've got COVID and you're in a coma, they connect you up to this and it's your heart and your lungs keeping you alive. Right. And I, uh, I couldn't sleep the other night and I'm, I'm scrolling through the, uh, the operation manual for this heart and lung machine. And I do a search on security and it literally pops up three lines and it says, uh, we have no security built into this, this device. We've got no endpoint security. We've got no firewall. The security of this device is wholly dependent on the IT network that, that it sits on. And if, if you've ever spoken to a hospital around their network security, you know, you'll know that it's generally complete dire state, like unsegmented, unprotected, unpatched, completely open. Anyone can plug into the port in the waiting room and get access to the heart and lung machine. I mean, like these devices are now keeping people alive and they're, they're fully fledged computer systems. They're no longer medical devices. This heart and lung machine, it seriously looks like an iPad on steroids and it's keeping people alive. And, and I just don't think enough focus or emphasis is put into securing these devices. I mean, I, I don't want to be in hospital or have someone I, I love and care about in hospital connected to a heart and lung machine. And I'm sitting there thinking anyone could log into the web interface and turn off the alarms or change the parameters. I mean, 
it really does scare the hell out of me. And, and I think that the world really needs to wake up and take industrial cybersecurity much more seriously. It just that is absolutely like, wild. Yeah. I, I think about it as kitty logging into the heart and lung machine, just playing oh, drums on the space bar it's, as your heart's just... Bitcoin mining, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, crazy. That story will come to life. Uh, I'm sure really hit a nerve there, Alex, when you do sort of present that in New Zealand. Because it's just yeah, like, yeah. it seems out of control, but it's such a like, kind of like the baseline isn't secure. In a way, yeah. Just want to, like it's going to be a room full of doctors, right? Which is weird. I don't normally present to them, but I kind of want to just scare the hell out of them and just say, "Wake up and and take this seriously." Like you can't have this digital future of healthcare if you don't have the cyber secure future as well. Like it's it's the foundation that is going to allow this digital future to play out. Um, yeah, and we're, we're not yeah, doing well. Absolutely. As Alex, on a similar note, in the episode in prep, we talked about some of the key trends and, you know, the over-digitization of everything. We'll be keen to hear your thoughts on, as a segue, but a slight switch of tact around, what are you seeing as some of those key technology trends or, you know, proliferation of the digital realm now that's really impacting us as cybersecurity practitioners? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think... Um... I think a key one really is, is the digitization of everything. I was, um, lucky enough to be in Jakarta recently and I was talking to, uh, a, a really large property developer there and they, they essentially built like a smart city, you know, water treatment, roads, tunnels, traffic lights, smart buildings, smart houses. Um, and, and everything has an IP address these days, right? So uh, again, it comes back to. The digitization of everything, everything's being turned into a computer system. It's all being given an IP address, but people really aren't thinking about securing it. I mean, you know, I, I, I talk to organizations about OT and industrial cybersecurity, and I always bring up um, IoT, like the smart lighting systems and smart door locks and building management systems. And, I, and I'd say, again, 95% of the time, so as I say, oh, yeah. You know, I, I know we've got these devices and I know they're computers and I know they've got IP addresses, but, but I've got too many other challenges and, and I'm just not thinking about it. Um, and, and if you have a look at the stats, like these smart devices now make up, I don't know, in, in the vicinity of a quarter to a third of an organization's attack surface. So this is a huge amount of devices that are just sitting there. And, and SISO's, you know, on, on the whole are really saying, yeah, I, I know it's a problem, but I just don't care at the moment. Um, and, and I guess perhaps it, it, it's commensurate to the risk, but I, I do think these smart IoT devices are going to be a lot more critical within organizations' operations. And when they stop, the buildings stop, and then, then people can't work anymore. So I, I think that's um, a, a really big one. And, and I think another one really is AI. Like as, as a cyber professional, I've been doing this thing we now call cyber for 22 years. Um, AI, I like, I don't think I've seen, I haven't seen a technology that has scared me as much as AI because of the pace of how fast it's moving. I mean, you know, we, we are now seeing attackers leveraging AI for phishing emails, for deep fakes. and, And I think they're really just dipping their toe in the water. But we are getting to the point where there's so much data and it's coming at security teams so quickly that they, they just can't deal with it. And I think that frontline cyber attack and cyber defense kind of landscape is, is actually an, an AI problem because it's too big for humans. Um, and, and that's exciting and scary. Like we have this massive cyber skills shortage. AI can help with that. AI can help automate the defense, it can help automate the detection. But what I'm most excited about is AI, like imagine having the knowledge of every SISO in the world at your fingertips as a chatbot and as a cyber professional, you can just query it. I mean, like that's so exciting. And on the other side of the coin, it's so scary with attackers leveraging that that capability. And I just don't know where it's going to go, but it, it scares the hell out of me. Yeah. I wrote heaps of things down there, Gabe, if, if you just uh, allow me one. I think the irony is not lost on me that we predicate the new connected XIOT uh, with the word smart. 
uh, and yeah. we failed to attribute the appropriate security measures that can destroy the whole <laughs> network. I think the irony is absolutely not lost on me there. Totally. The, um, you mentioned AI and, and uh, something that the AI trending and, and there's certainly lots of chatter about across the industry is that AI trending or the, the companies that are leading the AI race or the brain races, Gabe and I coined it in a recent episode. Uh, as open source technology, how does that affect the current application to security teams looking to implement it? The, the fact that AI is open source? Yeah, well, the, the current modelings are open source. With uh, We all know that there's, there's inherent risk in open source products, right? Yeah, I mean, there, there is inherent risk. I also think, you know, and, and be, before he went crazy, Elon Musk made the point <laughs> that uh, um that, that we need to democratize AI because it shouldn't just be in the hands of, of one or two companies. And that's why he kind of divested from, from open AI and, you know, has since started up Brock and, and funded a whole bunch of other AI startups. I, I think open source can bring a lot of benefits, a lot of you know, eyes on code and review, but releasing powerful AI into, you know, the dark web and, and you know, the, the realm of threat actors it is also super scary. So I really do think it's a double-edged sword. Um, and I think the good guys are going to need to use it better than the bad guys, but the bad guys are more determined, um, are often better funded and, and probably even more motivated. I mean, this is their business. This is how they make their living. So it, it scares me. I don't know how it's going to play out. Yeah. Keeping pace with AI, like running in a dream. It really is. Fun. It really is. what it feels like, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. Well, when, when I saw, um, you know, the, the Boston Dynamics robot, so they'd put chat, chat GPT in it. It was, it was talking and, and interacting and walking around. I mean, it was like the missing piece. They had the robots. Now they've got the brain and the talking. It, it's, it's just as scary as it is exciting. <laughs> Lots of, uh, it, you can't help but think as a security practitioner, just how daunting some of these advancements can be. Yeah. But yeah. of course, as a minus optimist, it's also very exciting as to what the future could hold. And it's like the transformation of everything now too, because we've got the information so accessible and so readily available. You know, sort of that 10X engineer or that 10X ISO or, you know, just to, to have that sheer level of depth of knowledge is pretty amazing. We're very keen to see how it's really baked into things like platforms and you know, chat products or just the day-to-day -day way people operate, even outside of a security operations center, where we know there's a very big means and necessity for sort of bringing machines to the machine, quite as you described it earlier, Alex, but just to integrate it into daily life, there's certainly seeing that, you know, the early adoption lag art taking place is a big Constantina for how AI is actually has the utility in people's day-to-day. -day. And I think that's going to be the key for everyone how it's truly used and like that behavioral change. I need technology just like a reading. Exactly. And humans can only take so much change, you know, in, in the way that they work and, and the way they, they do things. And I think AI is, you know, almost beginning to move faster than, than how humans can keep up and, and understand it. And, you know, if, if you look at the singularity, that that's it for the first time ever, it feels like we're moving closer and closer to that point where technology is going so fast, humans can't keep up anymore. And, you know, we, we, we're going to see threat actors and I'm sure they're doing it now, automating their reconnaissance and automating their initial, you know, a access into organizations using AI and, and the time to, uh, compromise the, the time to, to achieve action on objectives for a threat actor is just shrinking and shrinking all the time. Um, and. As a size of it, I mean, that, that's got to be super scary. It's not like you can just take a few hours off and deal with an incident later. I mean, as, as soon as something happens, it needs to be responded to. And it's getting to the point where uh, I'm not sure if humans are up for that. I think we're going to need to leverage AI in our defenses even better than the attackers. Um, and, and that remains to be seen whether we can do that. I think that's the pace that, uh, that Gabe is referring to. You know, we're trying to keep up, right? It's it's about staying in line or ahead of, I don't think we're ever going to get ahead of some of the nefarious yeah. actors, but at least keeping pace with, uh, and we know that they're leveraging AI at the moment. So, uh, it's, it's that pace is just continually going to increase. 
um, when we talk about the amount of information overload that exists within, you know, a CISO's environment or their operational requirements, um, that, that is intense as it is, let alone the impact of AI on that. Do you think that might be the, the crux that they can rest, uh, some, some waiting on AI to, to do some of that, that fast data analytics? I'd hope so. I, I, I'm an eternal optimist, but you know, burnout for CISOs is, is a real thing because the threats never stop and, and, and you kind of never have that rest from that, that, that adrenaline, you know, pumping through your veins and, and people burn out. I think AI, I think we could, we're, we're at a fork in a road. We could go down a path where AI actually gives security teams and CISOs a rest and is kind of that brain that, that has their back on a 24 by seven basis or things could speed up so quickly and become, you know, so much more dangerous that it, it, it may mean that sizes burn out even more and then the job becomes even more difficult. And it's already, I think being a sizer is one of the most difficult jobs out there. I did it for well over a decade and, um, it's so nice having a break. <laughs> I have no doubt of this. Your, uh, your skin has changed dramatically, Alex. <laughs> since uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's uh, that's fantastic. I think the uh, the AI conversation and the impact it's going to have on security defense is 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 as exciting as the developments in AI themselves. Uh, from a consumer perspective, I think it's uh, it, it's just going to continue to evolve, and and where we see ourselves in the next year, let alone the next five and ten years, is, is going to be radically different. Yeah, and and the speed. I mean, Sam Sam Altman um, apparently said at OpenAI's Dev Day. This may seem huge, but the next year is going to make this one look quaint. And, and if we keep going up that curve of technology acceleration, um, it, it, it's scary. You know, I don't think humans can live. The line that was sent through to me earlier this morning was actually about Sam Altman calling for Microsoft through the partnership and all the resourcing to go and develop super intelligence, which Alex, of course, to the point before is that singularity type effect where kind of leap from all sorts of capabilities and intelligence derived from humans and the capability of the machine intelligence is super intelligence and therefore it just completely takes it to that whole new frontier synonymous with AGI and the like. So who knows if that's actually what we see next year if we think retrospectively the first year of open AI has been incredible. Geez, what what is going to happen in the next year that is to come? Totally. I mean, uh, I, I was reading some of that this morning, Gabe, and Sam Altman said, uh, I kind of spent half my time developing, um, you know, chat GPT and, and, and our new technology and half the time kind of working on and, and thinking about AGI and, and trying, trying not to, um, have it destroy us. But there are a bunch of uh, leakers and, and rumors who have said that open AI has actually achieved AGI internally. And you know, isn't that just insane? Like I, I was watching a, uh, uh, an interview recently with, um, Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, who, um, is a godfather of, of AI. Like this guy developed neural networks in, in like the seventies or the eighties. People actually said to him, what are you doing? Like crazy, like this will never work. And, um, most recently he was at Google, I think as, you know, head of deep mind or head of AI. And he said, you know, we, we're entering a period where we will, for the first time ever, have um, an, an entity that is more intelligent than humans and, and humans will no longer be the smartest things on the planet. I mean, you know, if, if that's not the most seismic change in, in, in the world, I don't know what is. Like, it's just, it's actually mind-blowing. Yeah, it, it's crazy. And open AI are this close by all accounts. Was that the Jeffrey Hinson interview, Alex? Yeah, I think it was 60 Minutes. Yeah. Yeah, phenomenal. Um, it blew my mind, right? Like I'm, I'm not one, I'm, I'm not like, I don't understand all the in intricacies of AI, I'm not even close, right? And, and he said that, um, we've designed neural networks, but we don't actually understand how they're doing what they're doing. We know how the neural network works, but when the machines use the neural network, we don't actually understand how, how that's working, just like we don't understand how the brain's working. So yeah, we, we're developing this thing that is not only going to be smarter than us, but we actually don't understand how it works under the hood. I mean, if that's not super scary, I don't know what is. It's that Jeffrey Hinson interview. We're going to have to link that in the show notes because uh, yeah, I watched it the other day. It was absolutely phenomenal. 
Um, so Jeffrey Hinton is is arguably the godfather of neural networks and and now AI as we know it today. Really, in, in the seventies, I think if I'm right there, he was developing the pathways to recreate what the forgive me for what the uh, brain uh, has capacity of in terms of the connectors in the brain, and then recreating something similar. Um, he says that it took him fifty years, which is in this time frame to have something that is uh, is representable of the work he was trying to achieve in the seventies. Amazing, um, so it's phenomenal. But he also says in there, I thought it was really cool, in that um, they asked the sixty minutes interviewer asked him if uh, if if he believes that they are intelligent, uh, and he just yeah. straight out says yes. And then he says, "Do you believe they have experiences on their own and can make decisions based on those experiences?" And his answer was super fascinating. He says, in the same time as people do, yes. When I saw that, I actually rewound it and watched it again. Because I was like, is he actually saying that the computer has experiences and, and then learns yeah. from its experiences like humans? And, and he, he, I think they kind of said, do you think they're, they're sentient in, in a way that they feel and, and understand? And, and he just flat out said, yeah, they are. Yeah, it's almost like we need these fundamental definitions of things again. And not to sort of bring us back to this point, Ben, because it's just such a classic thing that we seem to go around in circles on, but it's like, just the, you know, define intelligence, like define sentience. What is consciousness? It just gets, for me anyway, it gets very deeply philosophical, very quickly. And then you need teams of ethicists and you need a moral discussion. You need the engineers, you need the, you need advocacy and human rights elements it's just like very multifaceted this discussion but i don't know maybe it's the way i think about it i just go this every time i think to just keep circling back to that point and, and what about a, a, a malicious ai that has been trained to think compromising organizations is its life goal and and learns from that and, and gets enjoyment and satisfaction from that um and just get smarter and better and better. And then, you know, like, just like we had Jeffrey Hinton 50 years ago, who spent 50 years learning about AI and neural networks. There's no doubt we're going to have threat actors who are now training and learning in AI and neural networks, and, and they're going to be building this. Um, and, and it's something that we're going to have to contend with and defend against. There's going to be good AI and there's going to be bad AI. Um, yeah, it's super scary. I just look at the, the botnet armies that we've had over the years and the yeah. size of some of those botnet armies, yeah. which is for, for, for those that don't understand, it's essentially uh, command and controlled uh, computers building a network of them to then create a mass army to do, uh, to disrupt or to degrade uh, networks or, or open source infrastructure. Um, but if you turn them into AI robots too, that then start understanding, having experiences on their own, they just become a swarm of bees that are looking for the next nest. Yeah. And what place does humans have in that? Like as, as cyber defenders and security operations teams, if, if it becomes just a war of AI versus AI, do we need humans? How do we need them? And, and, and in fact, Jeffrey Hinton said, you know, back when AI was first beginning, we said, oh, it'll be good at those kind of tactical repetitive task but it won't be any good in that creative stuff so all those creative people are safe have have a look at journos at the moment and then like the the writer's strike in in hollywood yeah. AI is so much more creative than we ever could have imagined and, and if it gets creative and then compromising organizations and and doing malicious things yeah <laughs> it's i love this part though i think it's it's such an exciting part of where we're at Something you just mentioned there about the Hinton interview, he also says in there that blew my mind away that, that really has, it had impact on me in that interview. Um, he was asked uh, if the, the AI systems are better at learning than the human mind, not more intelligent, but learning. Um, and he, he says a lot in this next part, but the, the piece that got me was that the human brain has 100, 100 trillion connectors within it. Uh, and the, the smartest chatbots that we've got currently uh, have 1 trillion. Uh, but in the same way that, that we're asked questions, uh, that the brain is not able to respond as quick with the, the amount of accuracy that uh, a chatbot has with 99 trillion less connections than our human brain does. It's, it's crazy. And, but then, you know, if, if, if we can pivot to something slightly optimistic, not, not the end of the world, 
he said, you know, it, it's going to bring bring about amazing advances in oh, science yeah. and, and medicine. And, and I, I love the fact, like, just how we talked about, imagine all the, all the size of those brains globally in one AI. They're now doing that with medical professionals, like with uh, dermatologists. You can now literally get an app and take a photo of a, a mole or, or something on your skin. And apparently it's as accurate as 99% of all skin specialists globally. And, and we're going to use that, that amazing AI power to develop new drugs and new treatments and keep everyone well. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's just as likely to kill us all. WebMD has just, uh, just become more popular. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Too good. Hey, Alec, to, to wrap up, I'm really keen to hear what you're most optimistic about in the context of tech trends and cybersecurity. Mm. It's a really good question, Gabe. I, I consider myself a, an eternal optimist, but I'm pretty old and jaded when it comes to cybersecurity. <laughs> um, you know what? I think uh, I, I'm most optimistic by humans' desire to share their knowledge and work together to make organizations more secure. Like we talked about machines destroying the world, but if I have a look at the collaboration that's happening in cybersecurity, yes, we could do more of it. You know, whenever I get other people in, in a room and or around a round table, they're happy to talk and share and learn from each other and, and help each other out. So I'm, I'm most optimistic about humans coming together and, and working together to make this world safer as everything becomes digitized, as that, that digital risk expands into hospitals and, and ports, you know, um, I think humans coming together and working together to secure the world makes me optimistic about the future because we, we're not going to stop doing that and we, we're going to keep fighting. Love it. Nothing <laughs> like collaboration and sharing knowledge, Alex. I reckon we need to spin up a bit of a Alex GPT as well. Start the <laughs> global SISO brain <laughs> network. <laughs> Too good. Love it. Well, thanks one. for joining us. Thanks, thanks for joining us, great. Alex, on Dark Mode. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Love your perspective and looking forward to the next one. It's been great to been great to be here after however many years. Thank you for having me so much. I've I've really enjoyed the chat. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Alex. Awesome. Thanks, Cheers. Alex. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel or leave us a rating on your favorite podcast platform. See you on the next episode of Dark Mode.